Now, the angle, again, uh, when we approach angle in n dimensions, we try to model our approach from our three dimension experience. So here I made some, uh, like a memo for you about the three dimensions. If you look at the two vectors in three dimensions, in this case, you quite well understand what the angle is. Uh, you know from, 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 the, from the high school that the dot product you saw in the high school in, for, for the three dimension, in three dimensional setting, it, is, it, it also can be computed like, like this with the formula like this. So you, you compute if this is my a vector, this is my b vector, and this is the angle in between these two vectors. Dot product of these two can equivalently be computed like this. You multiply the length of, length of a, length of b, and the cosine of the angle in between. This formula allows you to find the angle in between because you can compute the right hand, uh, sorry, the left hand side with the coordinate formula, which I left in the slide above. You can compute the lengths again if you know the coordinates of the vectors a and b, and you can solve for cos like this. You know it like that. You know it from your from your high school. Now, when you look at the angle in n dimensions, that's what that's what, what that was initially suggested. What if we just define the angle as the inverse cos of this fraction, just by mod again that just is a pure modeling from the three dimensional experience. There's no need argument for this. It's just we had it like true in three dimensions. Why don't we try to do it to, to make it make any sense out of it in n dimensions? So the question they had is this: What if I set my angle in n dimensions this time? So if I look now at the vectors a and b in n dimensions, what if I try to set the angle like this? I have a question mark about it because there is some some not entirely clear things around this around this around this expression. Who can tell me what 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 should be? I mean, we, okay, of course we can do that. We can just say like let just the angle be this quantity like this. Uh, the first question which comes to my mind when I, when I look at this is like, do we all will we always be able to compute this expression, or maybe on some occasions there will be some difficulties involved? Zero. Zero. Like when you compute. Well, all right, so it's actually part of the analysis part of this topic. The inverse cos, it has very restricted domain, isn't it? What's the domain of this, of the inverse cos? From minus 1 to 1. I mean, let's say the function inverse cos, it is defined only between two points, negative 1 and 1. If, if this fraction happens to be somewhere else, not between negative 1 and 1, you won't be able to take the inverse cos of it. And I don't know if you asked yourself this question before, but why... Or it is true that always we will have this fraction between negative one and one. What, what suggests that? You never ask this question in three dimensions, actually. It is actually here. It is, it is the content of it. You can see it here because in three dimensions, we know, we know this is formula true. This formula is true in three dimensions. And this is cos. We know cos between negative one and one. That's why this fraction in three dimensions will be between negative one and one. But when you now start your modeling for n dimensions, it, it is not like a, a priori true, why, why uh, it's not clear a priori why this fraction will be, be between negative one and one. So before we can say that the angle will be defined like this, we have to see whether this is true. If I call this fraction x naught, just for the sake of brevity, whether this is true that this x naught between negative one and one. Or we can also say this in the absolute value, absolute value language, absolute value of x naught less than one. In n dimensions, this question requires some looking, uh, some detailed uh, investigation. <clears throat> and that's the detailed investigation, which I call the theorem, which is also called the cauchy schwarz inequality. I don't know, you like the name cauchy schwarz apparently. <laughs> that's nice. That's, uh, uh, theorem, which is also called cauchy schwarz inequality, and the inequality is like this which says that no matter how high your dimension is, for any two vectors from any dimension, dimension, dimension space Rn, you will always have the inequality like this, which by implication implies this, or implies this. Uh, lecture notes has a proof for that. Uh, I, will, I will look at, the, at that proof because it's a, it's a nice proof, plus it also suggests some further concepts involving the vectors. Uh, it's a beautiful proof, actually. I mean, I don't think if I, I will be able to find this proof. I mean, when I was a student, I don't. Well, it's. I wouldn't say I would. I would be. I would be able to find this proof myself. It's. 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 An, it's a nice trick they use. 
Maybe I would, I don't know. Uh, here we go, look at the proof. I'll take you through it. The proof starts like this. Uh, it suggests to look at the function like this. Let's just look at this function. The function basically would take the vector a, we subtracted the scaled vector b with some variable t, the length of that, and square. This is a numerical function, although some vectors p is inside this function. This is a numerical function, right? The t is a number. You plug in the number, and as a result of the whole computation, you end up with another number. So it's a number to number. It is a function, numerical function you study in your analysis, very often, by the way. So we're going to look at the nature of this function. Of course, we're going to do it with the help of the, the way we do, because it's a length, right? Length of the vector. Length of the vector, here it is. That's the way that we define the length of the vector. So if I use this formula with the help of a dot product, the length of that vector will be something like this. It's a dot product of this vector with itself. It's a dot product of this vector with itself. Now, here goes the step where I will use silently, I will use these properties of the dot product, these three properties. This one, remember, distribution law, scalar multiplication of the, scale of the dot product, commutativity law, all of these will now be used because all of this is just something we have similarly, we, we, we have something similar with numbers. So when I look at this product of the vector with itself, I will just proceed as if with numbers. I will just open these brackets or expand these brackets the way I expand, expand the brackets with numbers. All of those three properties, which are just, which are gone now uh, beyond the, beyond this viewport, uh, the, these these properties have ensure that I can I can do that. So look at look at this. What will happen? Uh, well, just normal expansion, right? So this a dot product with this a, this a dot product with this negative t b, then this negative t b dot product with this a. And finally, this TB dot product with this TB, negative and negative becomes plus. It's just a normal expansion of the brackets because dot product, the, the key here, the key thing here was the commutativity and the distribution law. Well, actually, we haven't used the commutativity yet, but we will because what I will do next is this. I will abbreviate this dot product of A with itself as a length. It's here, well, half hidden. Uh, these two together, because you have a commutativity, you can just swap swap this b and this a around, and then it will be just a b, like here, and the t scalar can be taken up here like a common scalar. So altogether you will have this, and for the last one you have this. It's again length. So here's my function. The function we started with, it has alternative look like this. What's happening? Yeah. Alternative look like this. What kind of function is this? It's a para it's, it's not a perfect square. No, no, it's not a perfect square because this is like a, not a numerical product. But it's a parabola. It's a parabola. Well, one of the that's a typical look of a parabola. Any function like this, any quadratic polynomial like this has a graph of this of this nature. We extra know we extra know that the highest coefficient here, it's the positive number. It's the length of a vector. That's why I made the parabola with the branches going up. I also can ask the question, what will be the vertex of my parabola, the minimal point of this parabola? Uh, we know the general formula for this. That's a general formula for the vertex. If I use this formula, look at this, my b coefficient. I, I hope you understand that this a and b have, have nothing to do with this a and b. Yeah? There's no any confusion about that. It's just these are the numbers we normally use when we do describe quadratic, quadratic function or quadratic polynomials, this a and b are my vectors in, this, in, the, in, the, in the content of this theorem. So if I compute this vertex, the x point on this vertex, that's what I will have. Let's we'll just double check this. Uh, my b coefficient is this one. It's negative 2a dot product with b. And my double a coefficient, a is this, is this coefficient. So here it is, one, two, two is gone, negative, cancel this negative, so that's the value of the t naught point where this function will take the minimal value, right? It's, it's, it's in, the, in the spirit of what you do in analysis, or what you've been doing in your analysis part of this topic recently. Extreme points and, and this kind of discussion. This is a parabola which has this as a, as a minimal point of this parabola. Now what I will do next, I will, use, I will take this minimal point, uh, Sorry, I will take this point where my function takes the minimum. 
I will plug it in and I will find the minimum value of that. Uh, well, I'm not going to open all of the details. I put the dots here. It's, it's a relatively simple manipulation, so I'll leave it for you to discover these details. If I put this in, that's the kind of expression I will have. Let's see. Well, some of some of the some of the results here are quite small. Expectable this uh, length of a square is this part, and this negative uh, term it will be combination of these two when you replace t with this value. The final step actually of the proof is this: uh, the function here, this function, initially it was a length it was a length of the vector or square of the length of the vector. This kind of function is always non-negative, and that's actually another thing which I implicitly said on this graph you see I made my parabola strictly above the above the horizontal level it wasn't an, it wasn't an accident it was actually something which this function possessed all the time because like I said this is a function initially the function was set as a square of the length of some vector no matter which t you put here your length will always be non-negative number it might be zero but it will be non-negative in fact it will be zero on on which occasion this function will be zero geometrically how would you describe this this uh, special case when the function vanishes in terms of a and b vector. Yes, thank you very much. Parallel to the b. Parallel to the vector b. It's, it's actually a good observation. Just remember this for, for the time being. Now, actually, the proof is done now because if you take this, this inequality, if you take this inequality, it's a little transformation from this inequality down to this inequality. All you have to do, you have to take this negative part on the other side of the inequality and multiply the both sides by, with this denominator. And take a square root of that, sorry. Do I have it here? Ah, yeah. Actually, I do have it here. So if I take this part on, the, on, on, on here, on this side of the inequality, multiply by the denominator, that's the kind of inequality I will have. If I extra take a square root of it, it will be this inequality. And that's the proof of this. That, that's how we can establish a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in a very, very general setting of n-dimensional spaces. If you remember, for the complex numbers, we had a version we had a version of Cauchy-Schwarz inequality because when we discussed with the triangle inequality for the complex numbers, we needed that Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But on that occasion, it was, that inequality was very simple. I mean, the proof of that inequality was very simple. For the n dimensions, you need this rather extended argument with the parabola, extreme points, and everything. Now, this extra comment which you made about the, that when exactly this function hits zero, so when exactly this inequality will be equality, it's when A parallel to B. So in fact, sometimes the statement of this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, it's, it, it, complemented, it is complemented with extra statement, which says the inequality becomes equality if and only if one vector is parallel to the other. And the reason for that is that when one vector parallel to the other, this function becomes zero for some t. You, have, you can choose one particular choice of t, which will make A equal t B. That's our algebraic test for being parallel. And then this function will vanish. So this parabola will be touching your horizontal axis. You see, we have a topic, triangle inequality. In fact, if, you, if any of you remembers the way we proved the triangle inequality for complex numbers, uh, you will realize in, in five to 10 minutes, when I show you the proof here, actually that the proof here is absolutely identical to the way we did the complex numbers. The only change in that proof will be that we will replace the Cauchy-Schwarz with complex numbers, with the Cauchy-Schwarz for vectors. But before we do that, I actually ask you to look back at this picture again, because there is some interesting concept involved in the, well, in this, this proof actually shows one interesting concept implicitly, which I will make explicit for you just in a second. Uh, let's just look at this picture again. This thing, again, let's just look at this function we just studied with you quite extensively. Geometrically, this function can be looked into even further I mean, this is the distance between A and T B, but who can tell me on this picture, on this on this diagram, what kind of distances are those? These distances. These are the distances I'm talking about. For different T's, for different T's, you stretch your vector B left or right, right? You take a diff difference, which will be one of these dashed lines, and you take the distance of that dashed line, right? This is the the, the length, sorry, of that vector. Which is given by dashed, but by this dashed one of those dashed lines. For different t's, it will be different dashed lines. I just showed you a few of them. So this function, effectively, this function for different t's, it gives you well the square, but it's not really a big deal. The square of one of these lengths 
for different t's, it will be one of these lengths. Do you agree with that? It's quite obvious now, right? Because the, the length of the vector, it's a length of one, one, of these, one of these dashed lines, depending on the t, right? Different t's, different, different dashed line. Now, this point, this point, it was the point where my function takes the minimum value, right? But geometrically, we know quite well where the minimum for this kind of distance will happen, right? Where? You have to drop a perpendicular from this point down here. So this value, this value, that's exactly the scalar we have to multiply my b with in order to end up with the vector here, which hits in the end of it, the bottom of my perpendicular. Here it is. This vector, this vector, at the base of your perpendicular, I mean, the base of your perpendicular, of course, this little point, but the vector which originates from the origin down to this point, it has a special name. It's called the, that's the name of this vector. It's called the projection. It's called the projection of a vector A on vector, onto the vector B. It has a special name and a spe special notation. It's called the projection of the vector A onto the vector B. And now, with the help of the same proof here, we can actually give the analytical expression for this projection, right? All we have to do, we have to multiply this B vector. We have to multiply this B vector with this specially found scalar. So the formula for the projection, here it is. My T naught scalar times the B vector. 